Hello friends and welcome back to another episode of Spilling Studio. My name is Sam and this week we have seven new ARE practice questions designed to help you pass your next exam. One question per exam topic and a bonus question at the end, so stick around. First up is practice management. An owner would like a construction delivery that provides an early fixed price based on design documents, but gives the contractor the responsibility of determining the details of construction. The owner would also like to have a representative with their interests in mind during the process. Which project delivery method should be used? Bridging, CM as contractor, design build, or integrated project delivery? Feel free to pause here to answer. And the answer is bridging. What the heck is bridging? Well, it's a hybrid between design bid build and design build. With this method, the owner hires an architect to be the project manager. The architect advises and works with the owner to develop the project requirements. The architect, as the project manager, will work with public and private entities to get all the required approvals needed for the project. Then the architect will develop preliminary scope drawings and specifications for bidding. These are not full construction drawings, they are scope drawings just to provide bidders with enough information to bid on the project, and these drawings will allow the owner to get an early fixed price. Then the owner will send the documents out for bid and will hire a design builder. The design builder then takes on the responsibilities of the architect slash project manager and develops the final set of construction documents. The architect slash project manager will review the drawings and make sure they align with the scope package and the owner's requirements. Bridging gives the owner a representative with the owner's best interest in mind and it allows for a competitive bidding, a fixed cost, and a single source of responsibility for construction. In the design build method, the owner contracts with one entity. This entity is usually a contractor as the lead and an independent architect as a subconsultant. With this method, there is one source of responsibility, the design builder. Construction time is typically faster than other methods and the designer is able to get early construction advice from the contractor. Owners like this method because they are able to get a cost estimate early on since the contractor is involved in the design process and therefore is able to provide an estimate earlier. Some of you may have chosen this one as your answer. It's close, but it doesn't give the owner a representative during the whole process. In CM as contractor, the owner contracts with the construction manager for two phases, pre-construction and construction. The CM advises on constructability as the architect is designing, provides early cost estimating, assists with contract negotiations, purchases materials early, and scheduling. In this method, the construction manager is the one building the building. They provide a guaranteed maximum price or a cost of the work plus fee price to the owner. The architect typically provides construction administration services during construction. Integrated project delivery is a method that has all team members working together from the beginning of the project. This is similar to design build, but the owner has multiple contracts instead of one. Since all team members begin working together at the very start of the project, the design phase typically takes longer than other methods listed here. But the construction is a lot quicker since all team members were included in the design and know the, what the project requirements are. This ends up leading to a shorter project delivery time. This method typically has lower project costs, better design, higher quality construction, and fewer issues during construction. Now on to project management. A city is in desperate need of a major highway expansion and will require the demolition of six houses on each side of the highway. Which of the following allows the city to take ownership of private property while providing the owner with compensation? Down zoning, development rights, eminent domain, inverse condemnation, riparian rights. Pause here to answer. And the answer is eminent domain. It's crazy, isn't it? When I first learned about eminent domain, I couldn't believe that was an actual thing that the city could do. 
but I guess it makes sense because otherwise it would be difficult for cities and counties to expand and improve infrastructure as needed. So eminent domain allows a governmental jurisdiction to take ownership for the good of the public and the property owner is paid a fair market value for the property. Downzoning is when a parcel of land is rezoned to become less dense. For instance, commercial land can be rezoned to multifamily residential, which will make that parcel less dense. And a multifamily could be rezoned to a single family to become even less dense. Development rights is pretty self-explanatory. It gives the developer rights to develop a parcel of land. Interestingly, these rights can be sold separately from the land so a developer can transfer those rights to another parcel of land. Inverse condemnation is the opposite of eminent domain, where a government jurisdiction gives the property back to the owner. And finally, riparian rights allow the property owner to access a portion of the water adjacent to the property. They do not own the water, but they're able to access it. If the water is navigable, then being able to build a dock or a small structure is typically included in these rights. The way I used to remember this one is that it's similar to rip currents, which is fast moving water, rip currents, riparian rights. Associating those two together helped me out a few times on the exam. Next up is programming and analysis. Below is a profile of the topography of a site located in a hot, arid climate. The client has asked the architect where the best location for their new art studio would be. To take advantage of the microclimate, where should the architect place the building? Location A, B, C, or D? Pause here to answer. And the correct answer is A. For hot, arid climates, I always think of Las Vegas. And if you think about where that city is located, it's in a valley at the very bottom of surrounding mountains. It's actually completely surrounded by mountains, like it's in the bottom of a bowl. I know I've seen an AXA view of the city before that really shows this and I couldn't find it, but I think the terrain map and the image above gives you a pretty good idea of what that area looks like. So why did Las Vegas become developed like that? Well, placing buildings at the foot of hills or mountains in a hot air climate allows the buildings to capture cool air that settles in the valley at night. For cold climates, you want to go right above that. This way, we're blocking most of the winds from the mountain, but we are capturing the sun exposure to the south. This way, we're blocking most of the winds with the mountain, but we're capturing all of the sun exposure to the south. Temperate climates place buildings just below the peak for similar reasons as cold climates, but since we're higher up, we're welcoming winds in the summer. And finally, warm climate structures should be placed at the very top of the hill to capture cool breezes. Next up is project planning. An architect is designing a new 40-story office building. The construction will primarily be composed of CMU block with a stucco finish and a steel structural system. What type of elevator should the architect specify? Hydraulic, gearless traction, geared traction, or electric? Pause here to answer. And the answer is gearless traction. Don't let the mention of construction type confuse you. That has nothing to do with selecting an elevator. What we really need to pay attention to is the height of the building and what the elevator will be used for. Gearless traction is a great choice for an office building because it travels at the highest speeds of all of the elevators listed, and therefore it's able to handle the rush of people in the mornings, at lunchtime, and when everybody goes home for the day. A gear traction is an electric elevator just like the gearless, but it travels at much slower speeds. Now I just described two different types of electric elevators, so choosing the electric elevator in this question was not specific enough. We need the electric elevator that can handle a bunch of people at quick speeds, which is our gearless traction option. Hydraulic elevators are lifted by a ram that goes as deep in the ground as it goes high. So these are typically only used for low rise buildings, which is around six stories or less. These also travel very slowly. So they're typically used for freight or low occupancy elevators where speed isn't important. A brief pause here to remind you that I post new questions every week, so please hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on a video. It also really helps me out, so thank you.
Moving on to our next test, project development. An architect is working on an addition to an existing community center. Which type of joint should be used to allow for movement between the two buildings? Control joint, expansion joint, isolation joint, or construction joint? Pause to answer. And the answer is expansion joint. Expansion joints are flexible gaps that allow natural movements of buildings to happen, which is caused by temperature changes. In this question, we're adding an addition to an existing building. These two buildings could be made of different materials, have different floor levels, and therefore different rates of material changes and internal vibrations from occupants. So it's very important to focus on that joint and allow for expansion and contraction. With control joints, I like to picture sidewalks. If you've noticed, every four to five feet there's a little joint, well, that's a control joint. A tooled control joint is placed while the concrete is still wet, and a saw cut is done after the concrete has hardened with a saw. Control joints are placed to manage cracks so that they happen where the control joints are. The ground beneath the sidewalk is going to move and put stress on the concrete where it will eventually crack. These joints keep sidewalks looking pretty, by managing where these cracks happen. You'll see isolation joints if you visit a construction site of a building with columns or even in a parking garage. They create a barrier to isolate different parts of the structure like a column from a slab. The column and the slab are going to move at different rates and this barrier allows that to happen without cracking the concrete. And finally, the simplest of all of these is the construction joint. These happen as needed for the contractor to construct the building. Typically, architects or structural engineers will note this in their drawings, where exactly they want them to show up. At my firm, we have a tilt-up building currently in construction, and with this project, some of the interior tilt-up walls go below the slab. So our structural engineer noted on his drawings where to start and stop the slab so that the wall can be raised and then the second slab poured. Placing joints in this project was also important because we have exposed concrete floors and we want to make sure that the joints lined up nicely with other elements of the design. Next up is construction evaluation. The construction of a new five-story office building has just completed. What items does a contractor need to submit? Select four that apply. Extra material stock, certificate of occupancy, copies of change orders, Warranties, Operating Instructions, Certificate of Testing, Certificate of Inspection. Pause here to answer. The correct answer is A, B, D, and E. First, let's go over the wrong answers. So change orders are exchanged consistently throughout the construction process. So the owner, architect, and contractor should already have all copies of all change orders. Certificates of testing would be issued after each test is completed, so not at the end of construction. And the certificate of inspection is prepared by a third-party inspector who submits their findings to the building department. Then the building department will issue the certificate of occupancy if everything checks out. Now for the correct answers. Extra material stock, warranties, and operating instructions are required to be provided per the contract documents. You'll find information on what and how much extra stock, the length of the warranties, and what systems require operating instructions in the specifications. The contractor is required to submit all of this to the owner before the project is closed out. And finally, the certificate of occupancy is issued by the building official to the contractor who will provide a copy to the owner at the end of the project. And finally, our bonus question is, the portion of the exit access measured from the most remote point of each space to a point where the occupants have access to two separate and distinct exits or exit access doorways is what? Travel distance, exit, common use, common path of travel, or exit access? Pause to answer. And the correct answer is common path of travel. 
Common path of travel is the portion of the exit access that is measured from the furthest point in the room to a point where you have two choices of where to go. So if you exited a room to a hallway that extends in both directions, you would be able to choose to go left or right. That is where the common path of travel would end. Common path of travel is a portion of the exit access, which is the route that leads an occupant to an exit. An exit is the part of egress that takes you to an exit discharge or public way. Travel distance is the maximum an occupant can travel to the nearest exit. This distance will vary based on the occupancy of a space. And the last option was common use, which is not related to egress. It's an interior or exterior path that is not public, but shared by two or more people. That's our questions for this week. Remember to check out the description for links to some of the AIA contracts covered in this video. I've also linked some of my favorite study books, so go check those out. Let me know in the comments of any subjects that you're struggling with, and I'll do my best to cover it in the next video. Thank you all for joining. Please subscribe, and good luck on your next exam. You got this!